Hello everyone, welcome to True Crime. I'm Greg, host and curator of all the shows on the Indie Drop-In Network. Every week I find a true crime episode that I think you will love from an independent podcast creator. Our mission here is to connect true crime fans with indie true crime podcasts. If you like what I do here, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash indie drop-in. I'll put a link to the Buy Me A Coffee at the very bottom of the show notes. Today's episode is from How to Spot a Killer. On How to Spot a Killer, a former prosecutor discusses true crime cases and provides you with tips to help you stay alive. If you like today's episode from How to Spot a Killer, make sure you look in the show notes for links to subscribe. Enjoy the show. Begin. Welcome to How to Spot a Killer a podcast aimed at examining the motives, backgrounds, and actions of some of the world's most infamous killers. The purpose here is to learn from the tragic stories of the victims, so that hopefully, we don't become victims too. Let's get into episode number four, The Cleveland Strangler, Anthony Sowell. So this case takes us to Cleveland, Ohio, where we meet Anthony Edward Sowell. Now, before I get into this episode, I would like to thank investigative reporter Steve Miller for an incredibly researched and detailed book that he wrote in 2012. It's called Nobody's Women, The Crimes and Victims of Anthony Sowell, the Cleveland Serial Killer. I relied on this book heavily throughout my research. And as with all cases I've covered and will cover, I've included links to my sources in the video description and show notes. There's YouTube videos, you name it, check it out. Anthony was born on August 19, 1959, to a man named Thomas Sowell Sr. and Claudia Garrison. His parents weren't married, so Anthony and his three siblings, Tressa, Owen, and Patricia, were raised by their single mother. Anthony's sister Patricia had been born to a 15-year-old Claudia and an 18-year-old packing house worker who fled shortly after her birth. Patricia was sickly debilitating. Patricia was sickly with debilitating asthma, but by the time she was 18, she had five children of her own. Did you hear me? I said by the time she was 18. Uh, The final total was seven, three boys and four girls. Unfortunately, as with her mother, no men stuck around to help Patricia raise her children. In August 1969, Patricia unfortunately died at the age of 27 of chronic bronchitis due to asthma. So her children moved in with their grandmother, Claudia. And by the way, these grandkids had no idea that she was their grandmother. They just knew she was related to them. So the house was packed with Anthony's seven nieces and nephews and his half-sister Tressa all sleeping to to room. Claudia was not fond of her grandchildren. In their house on East Boulevard in the eastern part of the city, Claudia began to hit her children and her grandchildren mercilessly. This woman beat them with belts and even coat hangers. Not only that, their great-grandmother, Irene, also lived in the house. She used her cane to beat these children. One of Anthony's nieces, rightfully so, believed that the only reason Claudia took them in was because of the extra welfare she could get for them. When the family moved to her larger home on Page Avenue in 1970, everyone finally had their own room. One of Anthony's nieces later recalled the isolation. No one was allowed to have friends over, birthdays were not celebrated, and there was no candy or junk food. Unfortunately, the beatings also continued. Cleveland.com reported that almost daily, Claudia forced two of Anthony's nieces to strip naked in front of the other children. She would then tie them to a banister and whip them with electrical cords until they bled. As the girls became older and started developing, Anthony began watching the beatings more closely. In 1972, at the age of 13, Anthony began raping his favorite niece, who was only 12. The kids all watched one another's humiliating, ritualistic beatings. It was a part of their everyday life. The system also failed these children. On one occasion, when one of Anthony's nieces ran off, she was placed into a children's center. Um, It's a temporary shelter for troubled and runaway kids. Anthony's favorite niece followed her. 
She was terrified of the thought of um, remaining at the Page Avenue house with the constant beatings and the sexual assault. She actually managed to stay with her sister for a period of time, I think it was two months, um, before she was discovered and returned to Page Avenue. This girl was so desperate to get out of that Page Avenue house that she lit some clothes on fire and closed the door while the rest of the family was downstairs. Obviously, the fire department was cold. Um, she confessed, and then she was admitted to a children's psychiatric hospital where someone finally believed her when she opened up about the abuse. Unfortunately, her life from that point on was filled with suicide attempts, blackouts, psychotic episodes, and advanced mental illness. By 1971, Anthony was a high school dropout with a number of misdemeanors under his belt. Shoplifting, domestic violence, drunken disorderly conduct, breaking and entering, and minor assault. Faced with two options, either a life of poverty or a life of crime, like many of his friends, Anthony decided to enlist in the U.S. Marine Corps. He was 17, so his mother unwillingly signed the papers. As much as she beat her children and grandchildren, I read that she still cared a lot about her son. She treated him differently, and I think his niece once stated that Anthony was not subject to the same beatings that the other children were. Well, after a month after leaving, leaving Cleveland for training, Anthony's girlfriend gave birth to his daughter in August of 1978. Soon after, Anthony was dispatched for basic training in North Carolina. He now knew, unfortunately, how to kill or harm an enemy by hand using chokeholds and weapons. At one point, Anthony moved to Japan for a year with the third Force Service Support Group. It was there that he met an officer who would later become his wife in 1981. The two connected because both of them had rough childhoods. Anthony stated that she was able to help him through a lot of his issues. He called it the best relationship he would ever have in his life. The two were only physically together for two years before Anthony was transferred in 1984. The couple divorced less than a year later due to the physical distance their careers required. His ex-wife later died in an industrial accident in California. During his seven-year Marine Corps career, Anthony received numerous awards, including a Good Conduct Medal with one star, a Meritorious Mass Certificate, a Sea Service Deployment Ribbon, and a Certificate of Commendation and two Letters of Appreciation. One second, my dog is crying outside. Let me go and grab her. This is Sophie. She's a crier. I thought she was an independent gal, but she's very needy. Only when I need to record this podcast, though. Hi, friends. <laughs> Stop. Stop it. So Anthony's discharged from the Marines in 19... 19- that's why I didn't want to let her in. When Anthony was discharged from the Marines in 1985, East Cleveland was plagued by crime. Almost everyone he ran into on the street was smoking crack, which as you know, is the smokable form of cocaine. So 25 year old Anthony, who dodged his responsibilities as a father to a seven year old daughter, moved into the attic of the house on Page Avenue and began drinking every morning. Soon, Anthony started snorting cocaine. Not long after, Anthony was arrested for a domestic violence charge for which he spent eight days in jail. Following that, Anthony began to sample crack. He was arrested for possession of cocaine, and between 1986 and 1989, he faced numerous charges. On the evening of July 21, 1989, 21-year-old Malvette Sockwell walked out of her mother's house, got behind the wheel of her boyfriend's Cadillac Eldorado. She was pregnant with her third child. On this night, her boyfriend um, had some business to attend to, so he let her take his car, even though she didn't have a driver's license. After meeting up with some girlfriends at some local clubs, she drove to a motel that her boyfriend was staying at. It's about 6 a.m. on July 22nd when she arrived. As she pulled up, Malvette noticed two suspicious cars in the parking lot. They looked like cop cars. And Malvette didn't want any trouble. She was dating a drug dealer and obviously driving his car. Um, So what she did was she got out of the car and walked towards a payphone, but it was out of order. I think she was trying to find a ride home. It was at that moment that Anthony Sockwell approached her and the two began chatting. Anthony, who was just a month shy of 30, was in good shape. He spoke to her kindly, which calmed her down. Anthony told Malvette that his car was just a block over on Page Avenue and he could give her a ride home. It was now 10 a.m. as the two started walking towards the house. 
When Malvette entered the house, it was filled with the smell of freshly baked corn and the sounds of children playing. Anthony's uh, sister was also asleep on the couch, so everything looked safe and okay to Malvette. When Anthony asked her to go upstairs with him to his room on the third floor, she went. She wasn't thinking about sex when she went up there with him. But as soon as they entered the room, Anthony slammed the door. He locked it, drug a large heavy suitcase in front of it, and brandished the largest knife Malvet had ever seen. Myth number one, all serial killers are white, male, or isolated dysfunctional loners. If that's what you are keeping as your list of what to look out for so you don't get killed, listen clearly. Contrary to popular belief, serial killers span all racial and ethnic groups in the United States. Per an article by the Scientific American, real-life serial killers do not appear strange or stand out in any way, um, in any meaningful way. Many serial killers are able to successfully hide out in plain sight for extended periods of time. And those who successfully blend in are typically also employed, they have families and homes, and outwardly, they appear non-threatening, they look like normal members of society. Now, because serial killers can appear to be so innocuous, they are often overlooked by law enforcement, as well as their own families and their peers. Criminals aren't always easy to spot. Let's not forget that in 1977, Colleen Stan, a 20-year-old experienced hitchhiker, turned down two rides before a blue van pulled over. That van was being driven by a man who had his wife in the passenger seat and a baby in the back seat. Because the young couple looked safe, Colleen accepted the ride. Um, most people, unfortunately, now know of Colleen as the girl in the box. Because that couple, the cute couple with the baby in the back seat and the lady in the front seat, they put her in a coffin. It's a coffin-like wooden box underneath their bed, and they kept her there for up to 23 hours a day for seven days years people seven years she was raped and she was beaten all while the couple's two young daughters were in the house so don't let your guard down simply because someone looks safe or their family looks normal killers rapists and criminals come in all shapes sizes races and genders as you'll see in this case serial killers who hide out in plain sight are able to do so precisely because they look just like everyone else. So for the next 12 hours, Anthony raped and beat Malvette Sockwell. He then tied her hands behind her back with a belt, stuffed a towel in her mouth, and took a nap. When he woke up, he choked her until she began to black out, her tiny body losing oxygen and tingling all over. When she felt like her eyes would burst from the pressure, she started saying, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, over and over again. Not out loud, just to herself. And she recalls that it was at that moment that Anthony finally started to tire of the assaults. But then he looked at her and said, quote, you might as well say your prayers because I'm going to kill you. I'm going to beat you and then I'm going to kill you. But I'm going to sleep first because I'm too tired to kill you right now. He then laid down next to her and fell asleep. Malvette looked at the small window that was tilted open in the bedroom. She realized that escaping was the only way she was going to live. Anthony had already beaten her with his fists and cut her with the knife. She was certain that he was going to kill her. So Malvette rolled off the bed and hit the floor with a thump. She was sure she'd woken Anthony, but she was relieved to hear him still snoring deeply. Blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus, she thought, as she crept 10 feet to the window, which had a small ledge perfectly situated to help her boost herself up. With her hands still bound behind her back, she lifted herself to the ledge and she used her head to raise the single pane of glass, opening it just enough to slip her small 95 pound frame through. Now as she stood on the roof and looked out into the, into the darkness, she saw two older women on the sidewalk in front of the house. She turned around to show the women her bound hands which were no longer tied with a belt, but instead with a necktie. She didn't want to scream. She didn't want to make a sound, 
even as one of the women yelled, Oh my God, call the police. Within minutes, police, fire trucks, and an ambulance were outside the Page Avenue residence. Sirens were blaring. Two police officers joined a group of people that had now assembled in Anthony Sowell's bedroom as he continued to sleep. So Malvet watched as Anthony looked at the police and then at her before stating that he could explain. Anthony was arrested as Malvet was taken to the hospital. He made bond and was indicted by a grand jury in the fall of 1989, but he didn't show up for his court date. The registered notice of his indictment, addressed to his home on Page Avenue, came back, return to sender. It would take another crime to bring him in more than seven months later. On Sunday, June 24, 1990, a 31-year-old woman who was five months pregnant told police that she went to a house on East 71st Street in Cleveland where she was drinking with a man named Anthony Sowell. At some point, she said, he came up behind her and began to choke her with his arm while yelling at her. Anthony then pulled her upstairs where he raped her. Then he went to sleep. When this 31-year-old woman returned with police, Anthony was still sleeping. Police arrested him, but the victim disappeared. Fortunately, her absence didn't matter because a quick search revealed that there was a warrant out for the Mal- Malvet Sockwell rape. Can I just say, I had a couple of cases where um, victims would show up and for some reason or another, you know, they didn't want to talk to the cops, they didn't want to have to testify at trial. If you are the victim of a crime, even if you are committing a crime yourself, whether you're smoking pot, you have a small amount on yourself, I'm assuming... Let's hope a reasonable officer is not going to come after you when there's a bigger fish to fry, okay? So if you have an issue for the sake of your own safety, go to the police. Make sure you're available. Um, Be available for trial because your testimony could save someone's life if this person is dangerous. Anyway, with that in mind, at trial, Malvet bravely testified for the prosecution and Anthony was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Eight days after the sentencing, Anthony was taken to a prison in Lorraine, Ohio, I hope I pronounced that correctly, where he spent nine years before being moved to a correctional, um, another correctional institution. Anthony was supposed to receive sex offender counseling, but he never underwent any treatment. A cellmate of Anthony's in the 1990s later stated that Anthony refused to acknowledge his crime or take sex offender classes um, because he was afraid of becoming a target since sex offenders are hated by other inmates in prison. While Anthony found prison to not be as bad as he thought it would be, Malvette's life was falling apart. She was arrested in July 1990 on a charge of possession of a controlled substance, and after failing to appear for a November court date, She was sentenced to six months in state prison. In November of 1994, Malvette was again arrested and was charged with possession of drugs. This time, she got 18 months in prison, probated. She violated probation and was ordered to undergo mental health counseling and drug rehab. She violated again, spent time in the county lockup, violated again and again. Her life became a cycle of mental illness, drug addiction, and jail time. Does this sound familiar? Remember Anthony's niece whose life was spiraling while he was moving on? Awful. So Malvette also had misdemeanor charges in the city of Cleveland for prostitution and disorderly conduct. She was evicted from various apartments and houses numerous times, and she had eight children along the way. Malvette said in quote part, I knew that if he ever got out, he would do it again. And they just didn't seem to care what I thought. They took my statement, they had me ID him, and that was it. I knew he went to prison. I went back to the streets. That was the end for me. The time in prison, unfortunately for Anthony, did not serve as an eye-opener. He actually seemed to thrive in prison, completely failing to grasp the behavioral changes he needed in order to make parole. And as a result, he ended up serving the entire 15-year sentence and was released on Monday, June 20, 2005. The house on Page Avenue had been repossessed after after, um, Anthony's family failed to pay their mortgage. So Anthony joined them at their new home where 13 of them, nine of them children, were now living. He soon moved four miles away to live with his stepmother at 12205 Imperial Avenue. Pay attention to that address because this would be the last place he would ever live 
as a free man. So, one of Anthony's first requirements was to register as a sex offender. In this new neighborhood, in Imperial Avenue, Anthony was one of 12 sex offenders in a five-mile ra- radius. Unfortunately, Anthony was able to lie and manipulate his way through a sexual predator evaluation. A county employee cas- classified Anthony as a sexually oriented offender instead of a sexual predator. And if he had been classified as a sexual predator, as he should have been, Anthony would have been under greater scrutiny whenever a sex crime was reported in his area. As a sexually oriented offender, he was required only to report his address to the sheriff's office once a year for 10 years. Fortunately, that rule changed with the passage of the Adam Walsh Child Safety and Protection Act. It's a set of federal laws mandating that states uniformly register sex offenders and place them into a national registry by 2009. Point number one. Know who your local sex offenders are. I'm serious. Google National Sex Offender Registry and search for sex offenders within a three mile, two mile, or one mile radius of your address on the FBI's website. I have done this whenever I move to a new neighborhood, not because I want to live in fear or because I want to punish anyone, um, especially people who've already been punished for their crimes. I don't want to shame people. I do it because I want to know the faces of those who could pose a risk to me. Do not, I repeat, Do not compromise your safety by making dangerous people feel comfortable around you. Know who they are. So in the fall of 2005, Anthony met a woman named Lori. She was the niece of the newly elected Cleveland mayor while he was standing by a bus stop. Lori, who had struggled with drug addiction for many years, was intrigued by Anthony. They were both attracted to one another, so the two struck up a conversation and were heading to a bar before spending the night together at Anthony's step stepmom's place where he was now residing. I just can't imagine how that conversation went. Hey girl, wanna come over to my stepmom's place? I'm a 40-something old man, but we're gonna go up to the third floor of my stepmom's house. How does that sound, girl? You interested? Anyway, the two soon became a couple, so clearly that wasn't an issue for Lori, and they began living together at 12205 Imperial. Anthony put up with Lori's drug addiction because, as you know, when he was in prison, he wasn't using, and he took care of her. He actually seemed to be devoted to her. But by June of 2006, Anthony had stopped paying rent to his stepmother, and um, his stepmother was trying to kick him out. And to Lori's dismay, even as a drug user herself, Anthony had started smoking crack. He had also started having people over at all hours of the day and night. So due to his drug activities, a family that was renting the second floor space moved out and there was now an entire floor separating Anthony and his activities on the third floor and his ailing stepmother on the first floor. Now on May May 13, 2007, which was Mother's Day, 35-year-old Crystal Dozier, a close friend of Lori's, never came home. Lori and Crystal met in elementary school and Lori had seen Crystal in the neighborhood buying crack. After calling her mother to wish her a happy Mother's Day, she chatted on the phone with her daughter. Crystal was never seen or heard from again. Around this time, Lori noticed a bad smell permeating the house at 12205 Imperial. It was a smell that she had never smelled before. When asked about it, Anthony told Lori that it was his stepmother downstairs. His stepmother was becoming ill and her organs were failing. However, Anthony gave his stepmother's nephew a different excuse, that the smell was from a flooded basement. Though those in the neighborhood started to be bothered by the strange smell too, most people blamed it on Ray's Sausage, the sausage shop next to the Sowell house. This sausage shop, y'all. Let me explain. In 2007, the health department was informed that four residents had called their district councilman to complain that it smelled like a dead body across the street. If it smells like a dead body, I don't know, maybe it could be a dead body. Just a thought. Ray's Sausage spent more than $20,000 on new vents and an updated exhaust system over the next four years. But guess what? The putrid smell never went away. So Anthony's now smoking crack and him and Lori are always fighting, as I'm assuming some crackheads do. No judgment. I'm not, you know, saying anything bad about crackheads. I'm I'm just assuming that when you're not in your right mind, things are always, you know, 
kind of tense, kind of itchy. I don't know. I'm, I'm not a crackhead. These fights between Anthony and Lori were drug fueled physical altercations. One day in early 2008, Lori came home to find the house on Imperial a bloody mess. There was blood on the walls, floor, and on their bed. Anthony had tried to clean it up, even though it looked like there was a hole in his head. He told Lori that someone tried to rob him. Every time Lori stopped by the house at Imperial, it seemed like something else was going on with Anthony. In fact, in late February, Lori came by to find Anthony's neck torn up down to the white meat. He told her he'd been attacked while at a vacant house. Girl. Lori, I wish you could have listened to this podcast before this happened. I'm not saying, you know, I, what, I have two, two listeners, two followers on here. But perhaps I could have given you the advice I've given in other episodes. Run, girl. Run. Anthony was losing weight. His hands were always dirty and he smelled. It was kind of a mixture of that um, haunting smell of the neighborhood, that weird decaying putrid smell and also mustiness. He kind of smelled like old clothes. Anthony was hiding something from, from Lori, and she could feel it. On May 21, 2008, 30-year-old Tashana Calver, who had been serving time following a domestic violence conviction, walked out on her work release. On June 20, a warrant was issued charging her with escape. Her last known address was 12317 Imperial, where she lived with her mom, sister, and her six children. The last time anyone saw her was when she checked out of her work release program on May 21, 2008. She was not reported missing. In May of 2008, yet another woman vanished from the face of the earth. LaShonda Long was a 23-year-old mother of three who lived in an apartment near Imperial and 123rd Street spitting distance of Anthony Sowell's house. She was a beautiful woman, only four feet seven and a hundred pounds. When Nishanda started getting in trouble with the law and using drugs, her father and other relatives took custody of her kids. She would disappear and reappear every, every few months, but one May afternoon in 2008, Nishanda left her father's house to head back towards her home on Imperial. No one ever saw or heard from her again. In August 2008, Anthony's stepmother, who had been staying with her mother for months, got a kidney transplant. She never returned to the Imperial house to stay. Soon after, Anthony and Lori's tumultuous relationship ended as well. Sometime in September of 2008, 24-year-old Vanessa Gay encountered Anthony around 10 or 10.30 p.m. Anthony was on the phone telling someone that it was his birthday, but he had no one to celebrate with. Vanessa yelled out, I celebrate birthdays. Happy birthday. The two began to talk and Anthony told her that he had some crack and some alcohol before he asked her to celebrate his birthday with him. Vanessa agreed to join him and the two made the, their way to the house on Imperial. Now I understand Vanessa was in a different position because she was a drug user, but if anyone, if anyone offers you crack that is a red flag, people, crack is whack. Anyway, when they arrived, Vanessa noticed the black sign on the porch railing that read the So Walls in red lettering. They walked upstairs to the third floor. It was dark, musty, and dirty. I mean, in flag number two. Girl, girl. Crack cannot be that good, people. Crack cannot be that good that you're walking into a dark, musty, deathly smelling place. You know, to cop a little, a little taste or however you, you inject it. Crack cannot be that good. Anthony's bedroom had a mini refrigerator and there were curtains covering the window that faced the back of Ray's sausage shop. Anthony produced a, ch a chunk of crack and asked Vanessa if she had a stem. Vanessa did have uh, a stem. She handed it to him and he turned around, put something in the stem and lit it. After taking a hit, Anthony turned around and out of nowhere punched Vanessa in the face. He yelled at her to take her clothes off. Anthony started ranting about his ex-girlfriend Lori and how crack made her and how he was going to get these women back who did him wrong when he smoked crack. He then told Vanessa, quote, you don't deserve what I'm about to do to you. Anthony raped and beat Vanessa repeatedly after that. As daylight came, Vanessa asked Anthony if she could use the bathroom. 
Anthony told her where it was. It was just one door down from the bedroom to the right. The morning light was filtering into the hallway as Vanessa made her way to the next room. In the room across the hall from Anthony's bedroom, she saw something wrapped in plastic. The plastic was pulled up, and that's when Vanessa realized that she was looking at a body, but there was no head attached to it. The body was propped up, sitting up on the floor. Hello, true crime fans. Greg here. The sponsor of today's show is Nutribullet. Now, this is the last time I'll be talking about Nutribullet for a while. So if you want to save 20%, use the promo code TRUECRIME, all one word. And when you go to Nutribullet.com, I suggest looking at the Nutribullet Blender Combo. It's the one I have, and it's awesome. I recently posted a few pictures on Twitter of the blender in action using the 32-ounce cup and the Easy Twist extractor blade. Everything works exactly as you would expect. Aaron and I have made all sorts of things from smoothies to black bean burgers. The Nutribullet Blender Combo is the only blender you will need in your kitchen. Maybe you just want to add a scoop of almond butter to your morning protein shake, or maybe you want to make the almond butter from scratch. Don't settle for blenders that leave your smoothie filled with chunks. With the Nutribullet Blender Combo's 1,200 watts of power, your fruits and vegetables never stood a chance. Go to Nutribullet.com and use promo code TRUECRIME for 20% off your order. Once again, that's Nutribullet.com, promo code TRUECRIME for 20% off. Thank you to Nutribullet for supporting our mission to connect amazing true crime fans with independent true crime podcasts. When she returned to the bedroom, Anthony was worried that she would tell the police about the rape. Hello? Is a, is a body? How did he forget that there was a body in the bathroom? Vanessa looked at him and said, what's there to tell? After making her promise that she would come back in a few days, Vanessa Gay walked out of 12205 Imperial alive. She went to a friend's house and slept for three days before calling the police. This woman was exhausted. Over the phone, the police told her that they couldn't take the report over the phone. She had to come in. She felt discouraged. She didn't trust the police and had been failed by them before. So she decided not to go to the station to report the rape. And I get it. You know, uh, I said earlier that some people have their reasons for not wanting to go to the cops. However, in instances like this, girl, go to the station, save someone's life. This guy could kill someone. Anyway, Vanessa would try to move on with her life until a year later. That's when she saw Anthony Sowell's, Sowell's photograph in a newspaper. But we'll get to that. In October 2008, 40-year-old Michelle Mason suddenly stopped using the $1,000 of social services money that was direct deposited into her account at the beginning of each month. She'd left her mother's house on October 8 at around 10 a.m. and headed to the bus stop. She was on her way home, a rooming house, which was about three miles away. Michelle was happy, but she was frail. She was 5 feet 7 and weighed 85 pounds. Michelle Mason was bipolar and relied on a lot of medication to function. By age 21, she had two children and, unfortunately, she contracted HIV after sharing a needle with fellow heroin addicts. After being shot in a nearby garage, Michelle evaded death by crawling to a nearby market and begging for help. As a result of that incident, she had a glass eye. She had lived a very hard life. By January 2 of 2009, the money in her bank account was still untouched. Her son knew that something was wrong, so he called social services and asked them to hold his mother's checks. No one knew where Michelle Mason had gone. On the morning of November 10, 2008, 35-year-old mother of three, Tanya Carmichael, asked her mother if she could borrow $20 to buy antifreeze for her boyfriend's truck, Blue Chevy S10 pickup. She was borrowing his car, but his mother knew better. She knew Tanya was a drug addict and that she had relapsed, but would still not refuse her daughter that day. Her mother watched as she drove off. This would be the last time anyone would ever see or hear from Tanya again. After 48 hours of no responses to her calls, Tanya's mother walked to the police station to file a missing persons report. She'll show up after she finishes smoking crack. 
a desk sergeant at the Warrensville Heights Police Department told her. Tanya's family members searched for her, and they were told that Tanya had been seen around Imperial Avenue about six miles away. A couple of days later, her mother picked up the truck that Tanya had been driving. It was on the corner of 118th Street in Kinsman, about a 10-minute walk from where the Sowal house was on Imperial. Tanya's mother returned to the police department, and this time, the police took the missing persons report. In December of 2008, Gladys Wade, a 40-year-old woman who had been released from county jail two weeks earlier, was walking from her sister's house at around 5 p.m. She headed west on Imperial towards 116th Street for the bus stop. As she crossed 123rd Street, Anthony Sowell walked up to her. Merry Christmas, he said. Would you like to drink some beer tonight? No, thank you. I have my own, Gladys said as she continued walking. She just stopped at the store to pick up a 24-ounce can of beer and a pack of cigarettes which she had placed in a grocery bag with the clothes that she'd just picked up from her sister's place. Anthony fell behind as Gladys continued towards the bus stop. But in a matter of seconds, someone was approaching her, running up to her from behind. Anthony pulled his forearm around her throat, cutting off her ear and preventing her from crying out. He pulled her quickly up the incline and into the side door of his home. As Anthony drug her upstairs, everything went black. When Gladys awoke, she was alone and she could feel the throbbing ache in her throat. She screamed as loud as her injured vocal cords would allow before Anthony came charging into the room and began punching her repeatedly in the face. He commanded her to take her, fl- her clothes off. At five feet seven and 150 pounds, Gladys, who was a fighter, aimed to disable her attacker from where she lay on the floor. She grabbed his balls as hard as she could and pulled at his arm. She was fighting back. Gladys struggled towards the stairs and as Anthony continued to beat her, as she screamed for help, Anthony told her she could scream all she wanted, but quote, you're fixing to die. With Anthony's hands around her throat, Gladys tumbled onto the landing on the second floor. Her hand went through a glass plate in the door, cutting through her right thumb. Anthony continued to tell her that she was going to die. Gladys refused to give up. With her thumb bleeding and Anthony on top of her, she continued to grab his crotch and squeeze as tight as she could. As they fell down the second flight of stairs, Anthony was beginning to tire. He was severely cut as well, and Gladys had managed to tear at the skin around his eyes with her nails. He was struggling after hitting his head on the doorframe, opening up a cut on the left side of his forehead. Gladys fought for her life and ran out of that house. It was only 30 minutes since the ordeal began, and now it was 6 p.m. She ran across the street to the chicken and pizza restaurant across from Anthony's house. Her heart was pounding as she ran into the store. She looked like a crazy person, and everyone looked at her with disinterest when she started yelling. Blood was all over the place, and she was crying. When she begged for someone to call the police, one of the three customers who was waiting for their food told her that there was a payphone outside. But the phone had long been disabled. The restaurant owner grabbed a towel to wrap around her head and told her to go outside because, quote, blood and food can't be together. The restaurant owner, Fawcett Best, then called the police from his cell phone. Gladys didn't leave. She continued to stand there as Anthony made his way across the street with her jacket and sweater in his hands. Anthony told the restaurant owner that Gladys had stolen his watch and money. Gladys recalled that the restaurant owner and Anthony were laughing when he told him that Gladys had been smoking crack with him when she robbed him. Best called Anthony Tone. Obviously, Gladys felt disheartened and terrified for her life as she grabbed her jacket and began to run down 123rd Street. It was 6.30 p.m. and Cleveland police officers were on patrol when they were waved down by Gladys on 116th Street. Her hand was bleeding and she had a towel and napkins wrapped around the wound. Police called for an ambulance as Gladys told them that a man named Tone attempted to rape her. When police arrived at Anthony's house, there were signs of a struggle in the snow near the home. There was blood on the walls and stairway and broken glass on the second floor landing. They came upon Anthony, who was still wearing the clothing that Gladys described. He was really skinny, with a dark complexion and little facial hair. Anthony had scratches on his face, as well as two big cuts. He was arrested as Gladys was taken to the hospital. The next day, 
Gladys met with a de detective from the Cleveland Police Sex Crimes Unit. She didn't understand why she was meeting with the sex crimes unit, especially since she informed officers that Anthony had tried to kill her, but there hadn't been any sexual assault. Point number two. Whether you're a man, woman, or child, if you find yourself in a life-threatening situation and your assailant is a man, ask yourself, WWGD, what would Gladys do? Gladys would GFTB. Go for the balls. I don't care how you do it. Grab him, bite him, punch him, squeeze him as hard as you can, and fight for your life. If, like Gladys, you have an opportunity to get out of that situation, run as fast as you can. At the city jail, investigators photographed Anthony's injuries before placing him in a cell. Detectives then met with the owner and patrons of the restaurant, as well as a couple of neighbors. On December 10, 2008, the Cleveland police detectives met with assistant city prosecutor, and they all came to the conclusion or the consensus that there was insufficient evidence of a crime to prosecute. According to an investigative report, the police said that they did not see any visible signs of Gladys Wade having been punched in the face. A few hours later, Anthony was re released from jail. He took a bus back to his house on Imperial, cleaned up the blood and mess from the fight with Gladys, and because it was almost Christmas, he strolled over to the store for some beer. The following year, on January 17, 2009, 44-year-old Kim Yvette Smith didn't return to her father's apartment after going out for the night. Kim, whose street name was Candy, had a drug problem. She was frequently seen in the Imperial Evan uh, area, walking around, looking for drugs, and partying with friends. On the day she went missing, Kim kissed her father goodbye before heading out. She was never seen or heard from again. In April 2009, a woman by the name of Nancy Cobbs went missing. Nancy had just turned 43 and had been living with her 22-year-old daughter in public housing about three miles from Imperial. Nancy had spent some time in prison for possession of crack, and her daughter prayed that her mom would turn her life around. But by 2008, Nancy was hanging out with a guy in the neighborhood that everyone cheerfully called Tone. Every now and then, Anthony would stop by Nancy's house and drink a beer with her and her friends. She'd say hi to him whenever he stopped by. He seemed like a regular guy. On April 24, 2009, Nancy informed her kids that she had plans that evening. Nancy left the house around 5 p.m. Later that evening, she called her daughter and mentioned that she was with someone but that everything was okay. After getting off the phone with her mom, her daughter felt like something wasn't right, but she couldn't put her finger on it. Nancy didn't come home that night. Calls to her cell phone went unanswered for days. When Nancy missed a doctor's appointment on May 1st, one of her daughters started calling her friends. Soon, flyers of the missing woman were plastered all over the neighborhood. April 18, 2009 was the last time anyone had seen 47-year-old mother of two, Amelda Hunter. Her son walked over to Imperial because he knew his mother had a friend who once lived there uh, in a now vacant house. He stopped at the chicken and pizza restaurant where he spoke with Bess, the owner. Bess told him that he had seen his mother across the street at 1205 Imperial, but didn't know exactly when. Soon, Imelda's missing person posters were all over the neighborhood as well. In early June 2009, 31-year-old mother of three, Talacha Fortson, walked into a store to buy some lighters. Upon leaving that store, she was never seen again. After not hearing from her for some time, Talacia's mother called the police to report her daughter missing. In June 2009, 48-year-old Janice Webb, a mother of one who is known to walk the streets of the Imperial neighborhood looking to score some crack, had not been heard from by her family. She usually called her sister to check in, but when the calls stopped cold, her sister filed a missing persons report. Janice's missing person flyers soon joined the growing number of missing person flyers that now littered the neighborhood. No one, including law enforcement, seemed to notice that all the missing people were from the same demographic, black women who were drug abusers with criminal records, and that all of them, at one point or another, had been seen around Imperial Avenue. On July 2, 2009, a warrant was issued for a woman named Diane Turner after she failed to show up for a probation hearing. By the age of 24, Diane had three children, all of whom were in the custody of 
children and family services. Her kids had been taken away from her because of her inability to provide proper care and support for them due to her drug abuse problem. By 2009, Diane had two more kids. She did not have custody of either of them. The last person to hear from Diane was her one-time boyfriend. They had talked as they usually did on the phone in early September 2009. A few weeks later, no one had heard from her or seen her. Diane was known to periodically wash dishes at a Jamaican restaurant on 116th Street, not far from Anthony Sowell's house. As the number of missing women continued to rise, people began talking in the street but no one ever filed a missing person report for Diane. On September 22, 2009, Latundra Billups, a 36-year-old friend of Lori's, had stopped by the Imperial address where she had previously procured drugs from Anthony. The two sat and talked and drank beer and smoked cigarettes. The conversation soon turned to Lori, and when Anthony informed Latundra that she reminded him of Lori, she became uneasy. Shortly after, Anthony went over to the, the liquor store and returned with some wine. Being the direct person that she was, Latundra told him, quote, Some girls around have been talking about you, Tone. They saying you're a rapist or assaulted them. Within an instant, Anthony landed a single punch to Latundra's temple. He screamed at her to take her clothes off, and as Latundra lay on the floor, she watched as Anthony pulled a white extension cord out of the wall. He pulled it around her neck before everything turned black. When Latundra woke up, she was still on the floor. Anthony was sitting in a chair watching her. The extension cord was next to her. Her throat ached and she knew there was blood. I'm sorry I tore your sweater, Anthony said. He was partially dressed and it was still dark out. His voice was repentant but monotone. I want to kill you and I want to kill myself. I know I'm going to jail. Latandra began to say what she needed to to save her life. Instead of begging, she told Anthony that she wasn't going to send him to jail and that she wouldn't tell anyone. She simply told him that they both needed to get some sleep. She knew she'd been raped, but she pretended everything was okay. Anthony laid down and the two drifted off to sleep. When morning came, Latondra woke up to find Anthony looking at her. I'm sorry, I never meant to hurt you, Anthony said. I'll have some money tomorrow. I can give you $50 for a new sweater and I can get you high. Anthony then went to the basement and got a new sweater for her. Latondra played along, stating, quote, Sure, that's cool. Let's do it. As she dressed, she calmly told him that she would call him. She walked out of the front door, but by the time she was across the street at the restaurant, she was crying, heaving sobs of trauma and fear. She went to the emergency room to report the rape and was told by the counselor at the hospital that they already knew of Anthony so well. Latondra was told that five other women had come in. Two weeks would pass before she would hear from the sex crimes unit. On Tuesday, October 20, 2009, 51-year-old Sean Morris was sitting at the bus stop after a night of drinking and getting high with a friend. She noticed Anthony standing next to an ATM and recognized him as the guy with connections. She had some cash on her, so she approached him and he agreed to hook her up. The two had a great start to the day, drinking beer and wine and smoking crack. Around 3 p.m., Sean left Anthony's house to head home. Um, she shared a house with her husband. Unfortunately, as she was walking to catch the bus, she realized that she'd left her ID at Anthony's house. So off she went, back to get it. As Sean walked up the stairs to the third floor and down the hallway, Anthony grabbed her from behind and put her in a chokehold. You aren't going home until I say you're going home. If you try to scream or run, I'll kill you. Do what I tell you to do or I'll kill you. Whatever I say to you, you better say, yes, sir. He commanded her to take off her clothes and get on the bed. He raped her violently. When he was done, Sean started to scream for help. Anthony jumped up and ran, and ran to the room across the hall to close the open windows. He failed to notice that one of the two windows in his bedroom was open. Sean said a quick prayer before leaping from the bed across the room and pushing out the screen. She crawled out and was hanging onto the ledge by her fingertips. Anthony returned to the bedroom and tried to grab her by the arms to pull her back in, but Sean fell away from the house, down three stories to the narrow alley and the pavement below. She landed with a bone-crashing thud. She had broken both hands and eight ribs, and she had fractured her skull, but she was alive. The restaurant owner across the street 
who Latandra Billups had run to almost a month earlier, was informed by one of his employees that a woman was in the alley and looked like she'd fallen out of a window. The restaurant owner ran across towards the narrow patch of concrete between the Sowa house and Ray's sausage shop until he saw Sean laying naked and bloody on the ground with Anthony, also naked, standing over her trying to pull her up to her feet. An ambulance had been called and a crowd was starting to gather at the entrance to the alley. As Anthony tried to pull Sean around the back of the house and up the stairs, he said, I can take care of this. You all don't need to call anybody. She's my wife. I'm going to take her back inside the house. But when police arrived, he stopped. He informed officers that Sean was his wife and that she fell out of the window while the two were having sex. Paramedics took Sean into the house, but soon emerged with her in a neck brace with Anthony now fully clothed, falling behind them. He jumped into the ambulance with the paramedics, believing that he was in fact Sean's husband. When Sean came to at the hospital, officers followed up with her. She lied to them. She told officers that she was getting high with Anthony when she dropped her keys off the balcony. Anthony had to have said something to her. When Anthony shared the same story with officers, the incident was cleared as just an accident. Five weeks after, the rape and strangulation of Latandra Billups, a probable cause affidavit was signed. On Thursday, October 29 at 6 p.m., 13 members of the Cleveland Police Department's Special Weapons and Tactics, aka SWAT team, met for a quick briefing before heading to 12205 Imperial. Since Anthony was a violent offender, all officers had their weapons drawn as they entered the residence. They had no idea if he'd be home. As officers reached the third floor, they came upon a closed door. Officers stepped on garbage bags filled with clothes and debris as they walked towards the door. A familiar smell to the officers, the putrid, gassy odor of death became more and more intense. As the officers broke down the door, the lighted scope of one of their shotguns cast a light on two people. The room was dark. The windows had black plastic taped over them. One of the bodies had a clover-shaped silver pendant necklace around her neck, and the other wore a white dress that was pulled up to her waist, the feet wrapped together in a garbage bag. There was a shovel to the left of the body with the white dress. Police had found Talisha Fortson and Diane Turner. The officers who in the basement found freshly turned earth, suggesting a grave beneath the stairs. They soon found that this was the resting place of Janice Webb. The officers headed out to get a different kind of warrant, one for murder, not for rape. Emergency vehicles started to arrive as light rain fell at 12.205 Imperial. By 10 p.m., Anthony Sowell's house was a crime scene, the likes of which the area had never seen. The Cleveland police commander called a press conference and stated that Anthony Sowell was the suspect. He said in part, quote, We're asking for the public's help in finding the suspect. He is six feet tall, 155 pounds, wears eyeglasses, generally wears a mustache, and sometimes wears a beard. Meanwhile, a woman who had bought the house across the street from the Sowals in 2002 quickly drove over to Anthony's sister Tressa's house on 130th Avenue. There, she found Anthony on the couch. He was so nonchalant. There are two dead bodies at your house, and the police are there, she told him. I'll take you back over there. You need to talk to the police. Anthony, who was playing a video game with his 22-year-old nephew, didn't look up. Calm down, let's go over there, Anthony said before slowly getting off the couch. As they drove over, Anthony said two things. First, quote, that girl made me do it. Second, quote, now it's all gonna come out. As the woman pulled up to their block towards the lights and police vehicles, Anthony quietly asked her to take him back to his sister's place. This woman later testified that she had never felt such tension before. She did as he asked and dropped him off at his sister's house before heading back to her home. Her son was watching the commotion when she returned. Tony did it, she stated. And with that, her son walked out of the house and up to the first officer he could find. Mm, Miss Nelly Furtado has arrived for some snuggles. Want to stay up here and do the podcast with your mama? Okay, maybe later. On Friday morning, October 30, 2009, the teams converged again at 12205 Imperial as the body count grew. Janice, who had been found in the basement, had a green leather belt around her neck and her wrists were bound with two white shoelaces tied so tightly that they had to be cut off. 
Also in the basement, police discovered a red plastic bucket across the floor from Janice's remains. The bucket looked like it had just been filled with newspaper, but wrapped inside the newspaper was the head of LaShonda Long. Her body would never be found. In the backyard, dogs were turned loose to sniff for cadavers. As the teams dug, police soon unearthed the cause of the eye-watering smell that had been plaguing the Imperial Avenue neighborhood for years. That Friday, five more bodies were found in the backyard. Crystal Dozier was found with a piece of cloth around her neck, with her wrists and ankles bound with wire. Tanya Carmichael was found in a shallow grave with an electrical cord around her neck. Amelda Hunter was found with the strap of her purse around her neck. Michelle Mason was found partially covered by blankets and plastic garbage bags. Like Crystal, she had been strangled with a strip of cloth. Kim Smith was the last of the bodies to be found in the backyard. She was naked from the waist down, wrapped in black and clear plastic bags, with her ankles and wrists tied with strips of cloth. All were killed by some form of strangulation, be it ligature or by hand. Upstairs, Tashana Culver was found in a dirt-filled crawl space in the sitting room, the same room where Talisha Fortson and Diane Turner had been found. Tashana's neck bone, bone had been fractured, and her wrists were bound with rope. Nancy Cobbs was the fourth body found in the sitting room. She too had been strangled before being placed in black plastic bags and wrapped in a comforter. Nancy had a shoelace wrapped around her neck and another shoelace was used to bind her wrists. In total, 11 dead women were found at 12205 Imperial. Tashana Culver, Nancy Cobbs, Talisha Fortson, Diane Turner, Crystal Dozier, Tanya Carmichael, Amelda Hunter, Michelle Mason, Kim Smith, Janice Webb, and LaShonda Long. After being dropped off at his sister's house, Anthony Sowall grabbed his backpack and left on foot. Within minutes, officers were at his sister's door. They were accompanied by the neighbor who had just dropped him off. Anthony hid in an abandoned house one and a half miles from his home on Imperial. He was a drug addict, so by Saturday morning, Halloween morning, he needed to get a fix. Around noon on October 31st, 2009, a man was driving down 102nd Street when he saw Anthony walking down the street. The man immediately drove to the police station and informed two officers in the parking lot that he had just seen the suspect. Anthony, who had been all over the TV for the last 48 hours, was arrested shortly after. The serial killer suspect was finally in custody. Point number three. What are the red flags in this case? What drove Anthony so well? And how do we spot people like him before they kill? As I thought about his childhood, I wondered if watching his mother force his de facto siblings to strip naked in front of him before beating them mercilessly somehow brought comfort to Anthony as an adult. Humiliating and breaking women and yelling, take off your clothes, had been normalized and was even considered routine from his very early years. But no, Anthony had a choice. His nieces and nephews all grew up in that same awful household, but unlike Anthony, they didn't go around killing people. What Anthony Sowell did was his choice and his choice alone. As with other serial killers who embodied similar traits, Anthony Sowell lacked empathy. He lacked remorse, he was impulsive, thought he was smarter than everyone else, was narcissistic, could be charming, but that charm was superficial. He was manipulative. He had an addictive personality, and here I mean the type of person who repeats a certain behavior despite its harmful consequences. He had a lust for power and he was sensation seeking, and that is, he was engaging in reckless and dangerous activities just to feel something. Now, if you're going through this list and you can identify these traits in someone you know, Obviously, don't jump to the conclusion that they're a serial killer. It's these traits coupled with a number of other red flags, such as perhaps a violent sexual offender status, a history of domestic violence or assault, behavior such as stalking or obsession, and in some instances, maybe women going missing after visiting them, and perhaps the smell of dead bodies in the neighborhood. Just a thought. Now, the most infuriating part about the murders of women such as those in this case is that usually no one cares because they're poor 
and they abuse drugs. But those women deserved a chance to turn their lives around, a chance to watch their children grow up, and they deserved to live. A grand jury returned an 85-count indictment against Anthony Sowell. In 2011, a jury returned guilty verdicts for all but one count, count 85, which was the aggravated burglary of Gladys Wade. I will now read the jury's verdicts, and I'll ask the defendant to please rise. With respect to the matter of State of Ohio versus Anthony Soule, criminal case number 530885, sentencing proceedings as to count one, Tanya Carmichael. We, the jury, being duly impaneled and sworn, do hereby find that the aggravating circumstances which the defendant was found guilty of committing do outweigh the mitigating factors presented in this case by proof beyond a reasonable doubt. We therefore unanimously find that the sentence of death should be imposed upon the defendant, Anthony Saul. All 12 jurors have signed their name to this verdict form and have not completed the additional form with respect to life without parole as directed by the court. The trial court accepted the jury's recommendations and sentenced Anthony Sowell to death on each of the 11 aggravated murder counts. Anthony's House of Horrors was demolished by the city of Cleveland on Tuesday, December 6, 2011. Almost 10 years later, on Monday, February 8, 2021, the Cleveland Strangler, Anthony Edward Sowell, died of an unspecified terminal illness at the Franklin Medical Center in Columbus, Ohio, while awaiting the death penalty. He was 61. Whew. Thanks for watching or listening. If you want to stay alive, subscribe so you'll be notified when the next podcast is up. Until next time, stay safe. Thanks again for listening to True Crime by Indie Drop-In. If you would like your show featured, reach out to us at Indie Drop-In on all social media or go to IndieDropIn.com. See you next time.